Ryan Reese Show. From Southern California, this is The Ryan Reese Show. Post your questions using at Ryan Reese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Are you ready? All right. Tonight, Saturday night, I got a very special show. So I, as you guys know, I've been touring around the nation, or actually the world, for the last 13 years with the Whosoever's Movement prior to my... Um, job uh, managed a professional skateboard team touring there god got a hold of my life and he put a call and i started uh this movement called the whosoever's and we started touring with sunny uh from pod head from corn and several others and we've been a lot of music festivals sharing our stories and just being um just in the mix working with a lot of bands and this this name we would see this band called august burn red at august burns red at uh several music festivals and several venues and everyone kept telling me ryan you got to meet the drummer the dude that started august burns red you you have you have to meet them and you got to talk to them and i never met him and now finally after years and years probably 13 years finally i had an opportunity to bring him on the show and tonight we're going to get into it I've, I've seen some interviews online um of just he's he's a real dude loves god and he's out there in the mix uh just drawing just sharing his story playing music and using this opportunity so people could see christ in his life and you know i've interviewed a lot of different people and normally with the show um i get people that just love god with all their heart all their mind all their soul and they just their life exudes who Jesus is. And just from the few clips that I've seen online, this dude is the real deal and he loves God and he wants to see God glorified in everything he does. So tonight's show is going to be epic. I will guarantee you that right now uh, from the beginning. So um, we got Matt Griner on the air. How you doing, man? You got it. You got it. You got that right on the first try, man. <laughs> I was like, I got scared. I looked at it and I was like, uh-oh, dyslexia. Am I seeing things backwards? <laughs> hey, thank you, man, for uh, for being on the show. And um, I'm excited just to hear tonight what, uh, what God's done in your life and how this whole thing started because um, your band is a, it's a big band. Everybody knows your band. I mean, you guys have been around for a while and uh, have had a high impact on the hardcore scene, the metal scene. And you literally on every single, uh, before the pandemic, you guys were playing like all the time, traveling all around the world. But before you, we get into that particular subject, I wanna kinda hear how this all started because playing in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hardcore band like yourselves, it's, uh, you can get a lot of slack from the Christian world and at some aspects it could not it might not be accepted in in some arenas and you know i just want to kind of hear how you even got into it so did you where'd you grow up yeah first of all thanks for having me on the show it, it's nice to meet you guys i've been following you guys for a while and uh just honored to be here so thanks uh i i was born and raised in a really small town called Mannheim in pennsylvania and it's primarily an agricultural town, county, state, really. Um, and so I was born and raised on a farm. Amazing. You know? Yeah. Not the kind of place you would expect to find a metal band finding its origin. But, you know, I, I have seven brothers and sisters. Uh, most of my, my story has to do with my family and the family farm. That's where I started August Friends Red in 2003. I was kind of... Um, all, I, I fell in love with drumming when I was 15, and that would have been 2000. And as soon as I found drum, I just fell head over heels for it and just um, focused all my energy and time on it. But wait, really quick, and, what, how, what really quick, yeah. what was it that got you into drumming? Because it's like, I mean, I'm a skater, right? So I saw I saw yeah. a video of some guy shredding on a skateboard, and I was like, I, I want to do that. Like what event was it? Exactly. What concert? Where did you where'd you get um, inspired to pick up the drums? Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, at a Christian festival called Creation, which is in Pennsylvania. It's a really big festival in the Christian industry. And 
I was not really allowed to listen to a lot of different music when I was a kid. It was like just Christian, you know, and there was a radio station um, called 90.3 WGTL and they had a Friday night rock jam. So every Friday night, same thing. I would go out skateboarding with my friends and we would turn this on and it was like the heaviest stuff that we could find. Um, and I, I just had an ear for it. I, I, I love the passion in it. I like the authenticity in it. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to creation, um, in about 1999, 2000, I went and I saw a band called Newsboys play and I, I was locked in on the drummer playing. I, I had no idea what he was doing, no idea how to do what he was doing, but something about it just, uh, um, just resonated with me in a way that even though I didn't understand it, I knew that I was called, I, I was designed to do it. It was like, it's like I was built to play this instrument that at the time was foreign, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, do you know how, like, do you know how when you find something that gives you life, everything else that you have to do in life, all the responsibilities um, can be frustrating because they are pulling you away from the thing you want to do. It's like you constantly want to be doing this one thing and everything else seems to be getting in the way. And as soon as I found drumming, that happened to me. Uh, it was like, it, it was sort of like J.R. Tolkien's um, short story, Leaf by Niggle, where there's a painter and he's painting a tree and every other task in life seems to be getting in the way of this one thing he wants to be doing. That's what happened to me with drums. It was like, man, I just want to be doing this. Like, this is the thing that I love and everything else is getting in the way. And if only I could do this full time. And that's when I started August Friends Red. That's amazing. So how, yeah, how did that whole band start? Um, how, how'd you recruit the, uh, the crew to get in the band? Well, being homeschooled, it wasn't easy. <laughs> Most of my friends, like Dave Matthews band and, and uh, you know, music, I just didn't, I didn't love. So I, I was at a football game, a high school football game. And I saw two guys wearing band t-shirts, uh, or one guy, he, yeah, he was wearing a band shirt and I, I'd been listening to the band and somehow we just started to talk and and then i met some of his friends and we ended up um getting together at another friend's house and i found this network in Mannheim, lo and behold mm -hmm. that liked the same kind of music i did and a lot more and they were they were in tune with what was going on in the country uh, musically speaking and it just opened up this new world one day uh, i was talking to jb and brent who were the guitarists in my band the three original members are jb brent and myself and we were like, we should just try to play some of this music that we like. Um, so we, we covered three songs and played a show. And after that, it was like, let's just start the Red Around music. This is fun. Where, where'd you guys, uh, so where was your guys' first gig? Where'd you guys play? We played in a wood shop. Nice. <laughs> we played in a wood shop. Yeah, we played for probably, in my head it feels like 50 people. It was probably like five actual <laughs> attendees and then our, our 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 friends and our siblings you know dude that's it amazing. was a small small show but it was enough to to light a fire under our 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 butts and just like give us a sense of confidence you know that mm -hmm. we could actually maybe pull this off for fun on the weekends mm -hmm. and, and that's what we did we uh, uh we started the in material and we played our first real show at a fire hall for about 400 people we supported a band called this day forward who was a national act that, uh, who we booked coming through town like man we should just blow this show up as big as we can get it and there were way too many people in this fire hall um we played our five original songs and just really never look back after that so from that part you know, there's songs. there's there's people that are listening that they want to get in bands they want to start this and they don't even know how to, how to start and this is so dope this is how everyone starts it's funny i was watching that beastie boy documentary that that they put out a while ago on apple tv and it's so crazy how that whole thing started it's just a bunch of friends found people that look like each other connected it's like the same story you know they look the same <laughs> in the same music they found a little network and then they just started this uh, this band, but what happened is they just started playing gigs. Like you guys started playing gigs 
And then what you guys were just basically at a place where you were playing anywhere you you can, right? To get ex, to get the exposure. But where was it when all of a sudden like you guys got hit up by a record label? How that process because you know, obviously when you get connected with a record label, that's kind of like where you start taking off more because there's more momentum behind you. Mm -hmm. How does mm -hmm. that happen? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was a defining moment for us. We we paid to record an album, just an EP, five songs, mm -hmm. and we raised money to record this album. We, we we sold pizza, we sold these pizza kits, we donated plasma, and we had a yard sale. <laughs> and Perfect. We raised like, I don't know how much it was, but the record was about a thousand dollars, what I remember. Mm -hmm. So in the music industry, if you're handing a record label a finished product. Um, that, that's a huge win for a label because they don't have to invest, number one, in the product uh, and therefore take a risk. They already know, number two, what the product is. It's recorded. They can hear it. They can hear if it has potential. And number three, it kind of told the label that we were driven enough to mm -hmm. pull all this off on our own, right? So we got signed to a local label, and we toured on it uh, one or two times just kind of regionally, built up a local fan base. And then one day we got an email from uh, an A&R rep from a label called Solid State Records. Mm -hmm. yep. And Solid State was like my dream label as a kid. Oh, really? Yes. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It was like, this can't be real, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is, you know, this is Jonathan Dunn. I'm emailing you guys to say I like what you guys are doing on purevolume.com. And if you guys would be interested in – Signing with Solid State, we'd love to have you drive across the country and play a show for us. Wow. Now, we live in Pennsylvania, and we're, yeah, we're talking about Washington State, about as far away as you can get. Um, and so we're like, well, this can't be real. So we, reply, we replied, we're like, is this for real? Yes, it's real. Okay. <laughs> All right. Guys, are we going to do this? Like, this is a sign of commitment. This is a sign of dedication. We've gotten this far. It's either we do this and we see how it goes or we just play these weekend shows and eventually fall apart and go to college and live our lives. Right. Um, Nothing to lose though. Let's so go like, for let's it. Do it. Let's, let's go for it. Yeah. And that's exactly what we said. And the response was cool. You're signed. We just wanted to make sure you were willing to do that. <laughs> no way. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And then seriously. So we signed a deal and wrote a full length and uh, we recorded with Adam D from Kill Switch in Franklin, Tennessee in 2005. And that was the moment where we all made the decision to quit college, quit our jobs and, um, and go for it. And if it, if, if it worked, then we might have a career in this. And if it didn't, then at least we tried. So how many, so how many years have you been touring and you guys been touring all around the world? Because I mean, I was talking to my friends in Australia and when you guys were down there, and they were bragging about going to the show, and I don't know who you guys played with down there. Um, I, maybe it was the Chariot or someone. I can't remember. But um, how, ma how many years have you been traveling total doing what you guys are doing? 18. 18 years. And how many albums do you guys have out? Uh, 16 years full-time, 18 years as a band. We have, we're about to release our ninth. Crazy. Album crazy okay yeah so let's let's talk about well first of all when you're doing all this how's how are you working out your faith through this process because obviously you're a christian you love god you're playing uh on a you're playing in this secular world as well stages and or with secular bands as well uh non-christians and in christian spaces so how did let's talk about how did the christians uh, uh, it take this band and this style of music because there's there's two sides. There's the ones that accept and the ones that don't. Um, how are the ones that didn't accept? What was the response with with that? And how'd you guys navigate through that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's a great question. It takes me back to all those Christian festivals we used to play. Um, uh, sixteen or seventeen years ago, Christian festivals were just flourishing across the country mm -hmm. um i can name like five pretty easily um and and as far as i know none of them exist anymore pre-covid has nothing to do with covid it's yeah. just they don't exist anymore yeah right so at that time like we would 
we would be booked to play these Christian festivals because presumably we were a Christian band in quotation marks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because we were tied to solid state records. So yeah. Solid state it was known to be a Christian label. And so we were really never given the opportunity to, um, define ourselves as a Christian or non-Christian mm-hmm. or just a regular band playing music. Yeah. We were just thrown into this world of like, well, you are a Christian band or as a Christian band, X, Y, and Z. So it was a pretense. Mm-hmm. There was never a question about it. And, and that, that created in our band, um, this inner dialogue or sort of elephant in the room of like, well, wait a second, what is a Christian band? Mm-hmm. And, are we that thing that we define a Christian band as? Um, when I started the band, I had to prove to my parents that I wasn't just going to start a band and go into these venues and become a terrible human being. Yeah. Like the the household in which I was born and raised in um, was uh, what was under the belief that if you rub shoulders with evil, you'll become evil. If you are in a nightclub, you'll take on all of the characteristics of nightlife, nightclub, you know, um, promiscuous, whatever sort of deviant lifestyles must exist in these nightclubs. And so that's, that's the, that's the thought that I had going into this. And certainly my parents did. And I, I had to write a paper right before I quit college, um, to prove to my parents that like, Hey, listen, I'm not starting this band to do anything other than play drums. And by the way, I would like to tell other people about Jesus. What I didn't realize at the time is that I felt like I could tell people about Jesus and help lead them towards something that they needed. And in the end, what's happened is I've been totally taught and educated and shown how to really love people and treat people the way that they should be treated when I thought I was going to be the one showing them. Um, It's been a very humbling experience. Mm -hmm. It's been a very humbling experience. And and a, a lot of the judgment and hypocrisy and pride has actually stemmed from inside of the church and inside of Christianity and not so much outside of it. Mm -hmm. So much so that I would rather sit on a plane next to someone who doesn't believe the same thing I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, More often times than not, we're going to have a good conversation that that is seriously asking questions that matter Mm -hmm. instead of just assuming things that we don't really believe in. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're just taught to believe. Yep. And so it's it's been this it's been this this learning experience of like God, you say that you love us and you say that we should love other people, right? Yeah. Um, I started a band to be a ministry to other people, and in the end, what I found is the music industry has been a ministry to me. Yeah. And how to love people yeah. selflessly, and how to treat people the way I would want to be treated, even when it's a situation or an environment that I'm totally uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally, it's so awesome yeah. that you're saying that because, um, I had Sonny Sandoval on the show, uh, uh, prior to you and he was talking about similar things. And obviously I, I love, that's what I love about being outside of the church is because you learn to be in these uncomfortable situations. You know who you are in Christ, but then you know that God just loves these people that are not believers and, and you want to see how God, how you can not come in and tell them what's wrong with their life. You know, they know they're dirty sinners. <laughs> like everyone knows they're sinners. You don't have to tell them that, you know what I mean? But it's more or less like, God, you put me here in this situation and these people are so awesome, non-judgmental, and they actually have serious questions and how can we love people right where they're at and that they'll see Jesus in our life and if questions and dialogue happens through relationships because you actually think they're cool and they think you're cool, then cool conversations can happen and Jesus can come up and the conversation could go anywhere at that point. But it's mm-hmm. so awesome mm-hmm. that you think, you know, when you leave there, I'm going to go and I'm going to go do this and I'm going to do that. And God's like, no, I'm going to actually show you what it's actually mm-hmm. like to, to love people. What I truly say through the word of mm-hmm. God I'm going to show you the scriptures come alive, mm-hmm. basically. And you don't see the scriptures come alive until you actually leave the church. That's why Jesus says, as you go, you know, when you, the Great Commission, mm-hmm. you will see this, the, the gospels and all this stuff just actually come to life. And you really get a perspective for it versus just learning it in the church, but not going out and doing it. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, a couple of years ago, I wrote an album. Uh, uh, we wrote an album called Found in Faraway Places. And the, the title of that album is, is still one of my favorite concepts that we've been able to wrap our heads around and put out there because I've seen it come true. Mm -hmm. um, the prodigal son, over and over and over and over again, I see it in myself, mm -hmm. right? You realize how lost you are the, the further away you get from the, the place that people say you'll be found. And in fact, the people that I've met on tour, when they do find uh, the love of God, um, it speaks to them in a much deeper way oftentimes than what it would someone who I've known all my life in my church mm -hmm. because they've lived a life that has come up short. Mm -hmm. and they've actually experienced it. It's, it's not just some idea. Mm -hmm. It's real to them. I, I remember years ago I was in Amsterdam and I was a mess. It was the first time I was there. Some of the some of the tour went out to the red light district and out to smoke weed and out to just have you know have a fun night. And I was I stayed back on the bus. Um, like I said earlier, I, I was not raised in a home that, pre that prepared me to be able to handle you know the reality of like here's what's out there yeah. and um, maybe maybe don't look down your nose at everything, but like look at everything and ask questions about. Will it help you flourish in life? Will it help other people flourish in life? Yeah. Instead, there's just like this huge wall of judgment. So I was sitting alone on the bus. And I was a, a mess, dude. I was like, what do I do? Like, I feel like I'm judging everybody that went out, but I don't, I feel convicted about going out. Yeah. So I'm, I'm alone and I'm miserable and everyone else is having fun. And so I, I went to bed that night and at some point on that tour, um, I, I believe God, guy either spoke to me or gave me this dream or I, or I had this idea, uh, in my head of, um, a woman who has, has died and she's, she's sitting at the gate. She's facing God for the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she, she's, she's totally broken. And I had this idea that, okay, this, this girl has lived a life in the red light district, you know, she's, she's sold her body. She's given her body away her whole life. And she's been so horribly treated her whole life. She's never actually known love. And she's sitting there and God doesn't actually say anything, but her response tells you what God said to her just in his presence. And it's this, her response is, there's no way you're looking at me. If that's the way you feel about me, you must be looking at somebody else. And God responds and says, no, I'm actually looking right at you. This is how I feel about you. And she says, there's no way. There's no way you know what I've done with my life. Um, I've, I've never experienced a love like this. And God's response is, I see you. I see what you've done, and I love you. Mm -hmm. And her response is, if that's true, then I'll follow you forever and ever and ever. I will give you everything because I've never experienced a love like this. And that idea changed it, it 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 changed my heart a little bit in in that it gave me empathy for people who are living a different lifestyle than what I and the Bible would suggest that they live. And on the same hand it, it told me that when that person finds God, um it should convict me because when I get to heaven, I'm the kind of person that's real task oriented. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, I've done this, this and this with my life and God's going, okay. You know, we know what the Bible says about that. Yeah. Uh, you can't stand on your own two feet for your own accomplishments. Yeah. It's just dirty rags. And and um, that that woman sitting in God's presence is sitting there with this soft, broken humility, just soaking up the love of God because she has nothing to stand on mm -hmm. in her mind. Her accomplishments mean nothing. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh God's grace, you know, it's that one verse, um, those who've sinned much, uh, much more grace abound. I, I might have messed that verse up, but that, you know, the verse I'm talking about, basically those ones that have sinned mm -hmm. much, uh, forgives much, you know, um, mm -hmm. the red light district, um, back to where that story was at. Um, that's funny. You being there, a homeschool kid from a farm town in Pennsylvania and the red light district, because I've been there. I used to do skate. We used to do a, a, a major skate contest there every year, and they would put us there with adults and te you know teenagers, I guess, like you know, you know, under eighteen. And they put this huge skate contest right there in Amsterdam. It's not actually in the red light district, but you you stay in the red light district. You actually stay there, 
and then you take a, a ferry mm-hmm. across to this to this like little island where the skate park is. Then you come back to the red light district, and it's just insanity that they have this there. But the red light district is no joke. Like it's gnarly, yeah. you know. It's prostitution, drugs are legal. When you add those two elements together, and whatever's not drugs aren't legal, the drug dealers on the corners are selling the illegal stuff, like the cocaine and the ecstasy. Mm-hmm. So when you put all this gnarliness, pimps and all that in this area, legal, dude, it's one of the gnarliest places you want to be. And then I see you as a homeschool girl. You're not uh, 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 a dirty, crazy sinner, even like the way I was back then, is not prepared for this place. It's gnarly out there. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I was a, I was a. I was the guy that would fit in perfect there in the area in the in the drug world, but it was still like I remember being there and I was like, this is kind of gnarly. You know what I mean? So yeah. here you are on the bus in this situation, and then God, you know, ends up speaking to you about it. But it's 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 pretty crazy because but that's that's the world. And you know, it's funny that you say that about this red light district years ago. But when you uh when you look at the state of the world now, as we're just talking about reaching people for Christ drugs are legal around the world now you know it's like i live in la like you smell weed everywhere you know it's like there's just like that mm-hmm. aroma of weed or wherever you go now and that's where it is nationwide and you know whatever's not legal you can get pretty pretty easily and pornography is running rampant you know people are sleeping around like crazy that's just the thing is the to basically be a hoe you know if you will like just go out and sleep around and that's what the music's pushing through this through hip hop, Carly B and all these different people are are pushing this whole agenda. Mm-hmm. And that one guy, I forget his name, little little Nas with his new video that came out. You probably yep. you probably yep. scanned that thing. I mean, it is crazy time. But but we can't as the church go, Oh my gosh, this is insane. What are we gonna do? No. That's right. People are they're just the Satan is come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's getting capturing the minds of them. He's sucking them in. He's destroying them. But all that's leaving the emptiness. And this is why it's so important for us, you with your band, me with doing our great commission. It's all the great commission either way you look at it. But for us to go out and and have conversations and love these people. Because if you're into all this stuff, you're lost and you're empty and you don't have no hope. And I just, my wife sent me a, a, a text message or uh, she told me last night uh, when I was with her. She says that the opiate overdose has doubled since the pandemic. We know depression, mm. suicide, anxiety, all these things have doubled. So right now, the harvest is more ripe than ever before. And this is the time for us as Christians to look at the, the scriptures, to see what Jesus wrote, how we lived his life, going from town to town, village to village, loving people right where they're at, breaking bread with dirty sinners, the tax collectors, eating with them, part- being with them, not partaking in sin, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, so therefore we should have the attributes or the get, the 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 fruits of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of repentance, so we can live that holy life and be used by God in the world, letting our light shine. And now is the most important time. But we're going to be going to break here in in a minute, and I want to talk about some cool, uh, some more uh, tour stories of uh, you know how God used you. I want to talk about some new music. I want to hear uh, how things have happened during the pandemic. What kind of happened with you guys? What you got? What you guys produced during that time, uh, etc. I do need to plug a couple things um, for all of you guys that are listening. You know, I have a new book that's coming out May 11th. Uh, it's the Kill the Noise: Finding Meaning Above the Madness. Um, it is a discipleship tool. It's a faith builder tool. Obviously, you guys know I go out and share my story everywhere. We we lead people to the Lord, but I want to create a discipleship book that could uh, disciple people when I leave. It's a tool. Here's some chapter names. Uh, Let the Good Times Roll, Losing Control, Crossroads, Punk Rock, Jesus, Identity Crisis, Shiny Objects, Destroy All Gods, God Signs in the Storms, Live the Impossible, and No Posers. These are basically each chapter will show you who God is. If you don't believe in him, you're going to find out how to believe in him and have a relationship with him, and it will walk you through what sin is, what the works of the Holy Spirit is, and finding your life and your destiny through the Word of God. It's at the killthenoisebook.com, or you can go to the whosoevers.com. You can get past radio shows and book our mega tour. The Whosoevers is doing a mega tour. So we'll be back. Uh, 
with Matt right after the break in two minutes. Peace. More of the Ryan Reese Show coming up. Post your questions at Ryan Reese on his Instagram, Twitter, and or Facebook. Now, back, back to the Ryan Reese Show. All right, we are back with Matt Greiner. Greiner? I say I messed it up. Greiner. <laughs> Greiner. I told you I was going to mess it up. Matt Greiner from You're August right. Burns Red. <laughs> See, dude, I always do that. It's all good, though, because everyone that listens to this show for the last six years know I'm always messing up names. So <laughs> good to be back with you, man. Hey, uh, right, right, right before the break, uh, we were just talking about you touring in the red light district and just being on tour, uh, with the band and, uh, influencing many people's lives. Uh, tell us a cool story of how you've, uh, you know, how someone might have heard a song and it has related to a time in their life and how it's impacted them. And they've come up to you on tour and be like, Hey man, I was in this situation. I heard your song, the lyrics, and just really, you know, it hit my heart. I just wanted to come talk to you. Has there been any moments like that, how your music has affected people? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of stories. Uh, one of the best things about being in a band is um, the, the, the fact that music is common ground for people. Like I remember years ago, someone talked about surfing and how you have all these different ideas and opinions and division, and then you get in the water and you surf and, all of those things go away. Probably a little bit like skateboarding, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's the same thing with music. When you're at a show, they're, in most cases, just non-issues, and you're at the show together enjoying something that is a positive thing. Um, so here's a story. I was in Texas. This is during the Super Bowl two years ago or three years ago. And we weren't able to play the venue we wanted to play because the Super Bowl had brought – so, so many events into the city of Houston. So we, we played this hole in the wall. Uh, I just remember it being a black rectangular uh, building. There wasn't a whole lot else. It was, it, it, it was bad. We woke up on the bus. You know you know how you, when you're on a bus, you wake up in the morning and you open the blind, you look out, and the first thing we see is this uh, black building that was just kind of, Rashed. Um, we're like, all right, I guess we're playing the show. Let's, let's play it and leave as soon as possible. So that was the mentality the whole day. This is not going to be good. This is going to be a tough experience. And let's just get it over with and get out. Everybody had that sentiment. 
Uh, the show was fine. I don't really remember the show. It was definitely forgettable. After the show, our crew was loading out, and I was working out to, like, give myself some sense of today was successful, if only for this reason. Yeah. And there's a, a kid in my peripheral, right, who was, like, maybe 20 or 30 feet away. And I, I saw him looking at me, and with, with the, the sort of, you know, it just leaves you with the idea, like, he just wants to talk. Yeah. And I wasn't. I wasn't in the mood. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I had my headphones in. I just wanted to work out and get back on the bus and go to bed. And uh, 10 or 15 minutes later, he, he's still there. And so it's like, all right, you know what? Put the weights down. Go over. Just say hi. So I walked over to him. And uh, I was like, how you doing, man? He, he's like, uh, I'm doing all right. It's been, it's been tough recently for me. I said, what's going on? And he said, well, my mom passed away. And as soon as he said my mom passed away, he just started bawling. And um, I gave him a hug, you know, and, and he's just like, my mom was my friend. And she, she was really the only person I had in my life that, uh, I, that I loved and loved me and supported me and was there for me. And I'm just lost. Yeah. And I said, are you at the show with anybody? And he's like, no. I found out you guys were playing, and I came by myself. I said, wow. Um, I said, how was the show? He's like, oh, dude, it was amazing. It was so good. And in the back of my mind, course i'm thinking about how this is a show we wish we could have just skipped over right just get it out of the way yeah um and and then he said i came because i just needed a good word and um just saying that it just kind of makes me tear up a little bit because there's not there's not a whole lot of significance to that line when you hear it or when you read it but the way that he said it it was like I just saw someone who was so desperate for um, something, anything. didn't have to be anything significant, uh, but he just needed something more than what his life was giving him. I just came here. I just needed a good work. And um, so I had Jake come off the bus, and we ended up praying for him. Jake's the vocalist for my band. We ended up praying for him, and I ended up writing a lyric about it because we hung out for like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. The kid – He's an exceptional kid. He's a mechanic, uh, works his butt off, um, just just lives a really simple and honest life and lost someone that he loved and um, came all alone to a show to get a good word. And in the end, I ended up writing this, this song It's called Midnight about him because I, I ended up meeting him at midnight and hanging out for an hour and a half. That's until amazing. Call. And that was like one of the days on tour that I actually remember. Yeah. I don't remember a lot about that tour, right? But it was yeah. like that that day that I thought was going to be totally insignificant. Uh, and if I can just draw a point here to what we were talking about earlier, yeah. that's what I mean about the music industry. That's what I mean about ministry. It's mm-hmm. like you think that you can go into a place and change it based on your own grit and your own white-knuckled ability. And it's like, no, you can't. Mm-hmm. Because you look at a place like that and you think there's nothing that I can do here. There's nothing significant that would, that will come out of this, this venue or this show or this day. And then there he is. There's this kid who just needs a good word. And what it does is it teaches you um, how amazing God is and, and how he works in ways that you just can't dream up and you just would not expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, when you're, when you're saying this stuff, it just, it's just reminds me of that spirit, that life. We know that Jesus Christ He's the divine chess player, and the way he puts pieces together and aligns it, you, you just you can't believe it. You can look at a scenario and be like, what are we doing here? This doesn't even make sense. What's that, what's that kid looking at? I don't want to talk to him. I'm tired. Right. I want to work out. I want to go eat, and I'm trying to like <laughs> yeah. – I'm actually trying to be alone right now. But That's right. <laughs> God, if you're just sensitive and you can pick up the, the – you know – you piggyback the power and get the connection from what God's trying to do, those promptings. It doesn't always have to be like a, see that boy, go now, son. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, the whole earpiece. Yeah, thing. yeah, it's not like people think that you're going to, people are going to have those, you're going to have those God moments where it's like, to the left, there's a boy looking at you. He needs you now, go. You know, uh, I'm not saying that can't happen. It can happen, but it's something, sometimes these, these yeah. promptings, you know, you just keep catching the eye. It's like those are like, okay, okay, okay. But then God does this like huge thing and it's so fulfilling 
And that's the Jesus ministry. That's exactly the Jesus ministry is just that's these right. being led by his spirit and him opening these doors. And I, I was talking to him. I don't even know. I was talking to someone yesterday and we were talking about doing big, uh, you know, people think that they have to get up and share their story or, or you have to be in front of these massive crowds and you've played in front of massive crowds and you've played little punk rock, you know, little mini crowds, you know? And, but what's so awesome. And I was saying, I've spoken for thousands of people and then, you know, in front of a couple of people at a rehab, but I don't know, man, I get so much out of just these one-on-one -on -one encounters. They're just so powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's so fulfilling it to actually have this cool conversation and just see that God's like, I'm going to use you, Ryan, or I'm going to use you, Matt, to meet in front of this kid or this person and impact his life in a powerful way that's going to literally change the course mm -hmm. of his life. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's just mind-blowing that God would use people like us to do these amazing things. And we got to get it our. Is. I mean, I, I play drums. Yeah. Like you skateboard, and I play drums. Yeah. Like think, think about what the medium <laughs> has been for us getting to this. I, I I literally hit things. Like these drums right here. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I, my job is to hit these <laughs> these, these drums. Right. That's my job right yeah. there. Yeah. And people come up to you and they say, "Oh my gosh, you're so good at that thing that you do, hitting things." You know. And it's like, well, you worked really hard at skateboarding, and I've worked really hard at drumming. And you worked really hard to get out of that difficult thing in your life or that addiction or that habit or that pain and suffering. And that's commendable. That's noteworthy. But it, it only – but you know in your head and I know in mine, we only got so far on our own. Yeah. And then something was there that met us, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I put in work to play drums, but there's no way – that I did all of this on my own. Yeah. I did some of it. I worked hard and I, I put in the time, but it's like, there's something else at work here. And, and there are a lot of different ideas about what that thing is. Um, I, I just so happen to believe that it's a God who's given me the ability to play drums mm -hmm. and use it however I wish, because that's how awesome God is. He's mm -hmm. like, I'm going to give you this thing and you can use it for your own glory and to do your own thing, or you can use it to help people and teach people and lead people, even if it is something as <laughs> nuts as just hitting things. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it's, crazy. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And what's so cool is that as you know, and I know just from what we're doing with our lives is put God first is that he's the one that opens all these doors. And if you put him first to glorify him, and I'm not talking about being like just a corny Christian, like that I, I tell everyone, Please don't be a corny Christian. You're giving Christians a bad name. Just be who you are, who God created you to be, and use these gifts and these talents right. for his glory. And he's the one that says that he raises up kings and he brings them down. He's he's the, again, he's the divine chess player. He, he'll put you right next to a king if he needs to. You know what I mean? He does That's it right. all. But what he wants out of our lives is that we put him first and we don't compromise and we, like, you know, you 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 going back to Amsterdam. You stuck to your convictions, and you didn't get out. And that's just where you were at at that time in your life. And and God will honor it to stick to your convictions of what He's doing, and He'll continue to develop and mold and shape you into what He He wants you to be. But just continue that's to exactly give right. Him glory. That's the whole thing. Um, we have 14 minutes left, so I want to talk to you about. Uh, well, what? Okay, first of all. What happened during the pandemic with you guys and what projects are you guys working on? Dude, we were out with Kill Switch Engage. We had like a five week tour plan. Okay. And we played we played three shows. First show, no problem. Nineteen hundred tickets sold, ninety people didn't show up. That's a that's a really good it's called a drop rate. Like that's nothing. People weren't concerned at all about this this COVID thing, this idea of COVID. Second show about 1,900 tickets sold, same thing. Like 90 people didn't come out. People still weren't concerned. Uh, NCAA pulled the tournament. Live Nation reached out to us, I think the third show, day of the third show, and we played it and went home, and we haven't played a live show since. That was like March 12th or... Where was that, that at? Where, where were you guys on tour? We were still on the East Coast. Okay, so it's the East Coast, got we it. We were still on the East Coast. Yep. Oh, get this. So, so, so we were, uh, we, we drove home after the show on Thursday. We were in Louisville, Kentucky. Friday was supposed to be Philadelphia, which is our hometown 
city, the closest thing to mm. us on that tour. Yeah. And there were like over 2000 tickets sold. It was obviously special for us because it's the closest to home. And instead of going to Philly and loading in at the Fillmore, <laughs> yeah. we drove to Mannheim to our storage unit, which is called Move In, M O O O B E, <laughs> self storage. And we unloaded our trailer. And I remember standing there in the storage unit just thinking, this is so bizarre. Instead of loading into the Fillmore to play a show, we're loading back into our storage unit that we just left four days prior. Unbelievable. And then it was like, oh, you guys, you know, we'll get the tour, you know, maybe like uh, summertime, September. Europe's going to have to wait till like June, push that back a little bit. And then yep. it just kept getting pushed back and back and back. So it's, it's the story of all musicians over 2020. Um, but we've been we've been really fortunate. Uh, I'm I'm really fortunate to be in a band with hardworking band members who are creative and uh, just all in. And so we've done two live stream shows oh. last year, and we have another one coming up on May 22nd. So uh, we have a record from 10 years ago called Leveler. If you are a fan of August Burns Red, um, and you're a new fan, you have to go back. And if you're an old fan, it's probably one that you grew up listening to. And we just re-recorded the album last uh it would have been like january of this year february so we have the re-recorded 10 year anniversary album edition of leveler and the live stream show coming up may 21st and 22nd um so by the time this episode comes out hindsight but uh we've been working really hard at putting all of this together and we've been we've been ultimately really fortunate to stay busy and active that's amazing. Or do you have any, uh, have you guys been booking at all as of now? Is there anything been, uh, any tours happening? Yeah, we officially have a European tour scheduled for 2022, mm -hmm. but we have some stuff in the works, um, that will hopefully happen before that. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously still like a big fingers crossed yeah. thing, but there's, there's a lot of optimism Yeah. that, yeah tours will start to pick up and um i see tours being booked in august and september yep. and october now so i don't i think we're much closer to the end than what we are to the beginning at this point yeah yes it's been a while well i think everyone's gonna be excited shows the first show is gonna go nuts uh imagine oh, that <laughs> it's gonna get i cannot <laughs> wait to go to something man yeah can you can you imagine like we talked about just having a big red scissors and uh, like a ribbon across the stage. And we come out, we just go whoop, cut it. Dude. Yes. Crowd cheers. And we start playing whitewash, you know, like it's, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Gonna be nuts. It's going to be nuts. All right. I gotta, I gotta track you guys down and, and, and cross paths with you. I'm going to actually be out in Delaware. Uh, that's, that's in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to be out in that area. I'll probably go down to, into Philly. How far are you from Philly? Uh, pretty close at like an hour and a half. Got I mean, it. Delaware is close too. Uh, How soon are you going to be there? Um, I got to look at the dates. Um, I'm going out there to speak in Delaware and then I should be, I'm going to go uh, do some, some ministry stuff in King Kingsington. You know, you've heard of that, right? Kings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, have, I have a friend down there. He has a, he's an ex pro boxer and he has like a gym down there, but he does all kinds of ministry down there. He has a church. So, but it's like, you know, I say it's like Jurassic Park down there. You know, you're driving through the car and you're like looking out the windows. It's like <laughs> I see some crazy stuff, but I want to go do some street ministry out there. Uh, I love being in those those sketchy environments. Um, but then I'm yeah. going to probably go to nice. Philly to speak to, and speak at Calvary Chapel, Philly. So uh, and then even go to Brooklyn. So I'm going to do a little East Coast hopping around for a few days. It's cool because it's so kind of small there. You could just drive everywhere fast. That's what I love about. It's you can like, drive everywhere. It's not like California. It's like I want to get to Northern California. You're like eight hours minimum. You know, that's not even <laughs> up there. That's just San Francisco. You know, that, you better just fly at that point, dude. It's yeah, it's too crazy. Yeah, California is lo it's it's too big. But uh, all right. So um, so you got new shows going on, and then hey, you you have a website that you actually teach kids how to play your songs and drums, right? Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually in my studio right now. I always wanted to build a studio, and COVID gave me, COVID gave me the the time and space to do it. Uh, maybe not the money to do it, but I, I just <laughs> went all in on it. And, uh, so I, I built this home studio, and I launched a website, MacRinderLessons.com. I, I break down August Friends Red songs on drums, um, 
So I, I pick some of the biggest ones and then maybe some of the ones I like playing, even though they're not the biggest. And I, I play them at full speed, 88% speed and 75% speed, right? So you can learn them slower tempos and then speed them up. That's amazing. Then I also do like favorite part, hardest part. I do an introduction about each song. I have some courses on there for just generally speaking, how to play grooves that I like, how to play some fills that I like. Um, and it's, it's been fun. We have a great community. Uh, I, I like, I like the drummers that we have on board. We get together every Wednesday night and do a drummer hangout. We have, you know, a guest on, we just had Josh divine from one direction on last night. Mm -hmm. And to your mistake earlier, I said his name wrong. I never met him before. And I was like, Josh Devine, how are you? Great to meet you. Thanks for coming on the show. He's like, uh, it's not, you said it wrong. <laughs> Aver, wait, Avril Levine's not your sister? <laughs> Avril Levine. I was like, I'm just thinking Levine here. Divine. Okay. Of course your name's Divine. That's amazing. So um, it, it, it's a great time. If, if, if you're looking to learn anything on drums or you really like August and Dread and you're a drummer, or aspiring drummer, check it out. It's ten bucks a month. Yeah, uh, you can cancel or suspend at any time. It's pretty cheap, and it's a great community. I've I've been having a lot of fun with it. That's amazing. Um, I do want to uh, before we close. There was a there was a song you were talking about in this interview I saw earlier, and it was a song that had to do with like faith and storms and being in the desert. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, it was a song you guys wrote. Um, it just it, it 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 was like about a time like where you have to have faith in these storms when you're in these desert areas. I, I can't remember the name of the song, but it was. Okay. It, it, uh, we have a more recent song standing in the storm. Um, that that's a more recent song. We have an older song called Meridian mm -hmm. where that, it's a slower, doomier song. That was it. That, okay. Yeah, that was Meridian. it. Tell, tell us about that because right now during the pandemic, there's been a lot of people in the storm and they need faith. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we were writing constellations and, uh, I was reading Jeremiah. Um, and I, I found a verse that, um, I believe it's Jeremiah. It says, those who survive the sword will find favor in the desert. I wrote a lyric based on that very short lyric. Meridian has probably 30 words in the whole song. It talks about how, um, God is the, artist and he's making this mess into a masterpiece and he yes. will rebuild us he will rebuild us uh, and i truly believe that in my own life and experience of going through difficulty and loss um i i've i found uh found i found that god rebuilds me in a way that i just wouldn't have been rebuilt if I wasn't in that difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, man, that, that song's important to us, you know, as a band, it's, it's important to me as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I, I think about with all the difficulty and, and this pain during COVID, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's depression and anxiety or physical death or mm -hmm. uh, fear of what's going to happen. Um, God, God will use this time. And he will rebuild the church. The church, the church needed the church needed this. Yeah. I really believe the church needed to be tested, and the church has been massively tested during the last year. Yes, one hundred percent. When when you, right? uh, I mean, just massively tested. When you when you uh, when you were talking about that in that interview that I saw, it really spoke to me because I've been going through a very crazy season in my own personal life, and it feels like it's a mess sometimes. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like I can't. It's like just like just trying to get through each day with all the different things that I'm involved with and, and yeah. all the details and, and just, it just feels like the season just feels like a tornado, you know, and I'm just, God's grace is, is getting me through it every day, but it's been a very crazy time. And when you said that today, it was just this reminder. I'm like, yeah, this, this God makes a mess into a masterpiece. And I don't think it's like, my life doesn't feel like it's a, a, a mess. I just feel like things are messy because there's so many projects and stuff going on that I'm, I'm more yeah. like, I'm very organized. I like to be like, we're going to do this. We're going to knock these things out. But every, it's like all these things that 
all these opportunities that open that God has opened me and it's his grace is sufficient through it and he's going to put it all together and he's going to get the glory and I'm just like God you have to do it you have to do it you have to do it and give me the grace to get mm. through it but you really spoke to me when I was when I was watching it, and that's why I wanted to to share that with you because there's people that are listening now and and they have to know that God can make a masterpiece out of a, your life might feel like a mess but he's the one that is the potter and 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 you're on the wheel and he's forming you and shaping you and molding you and creating you into that vessel that he wants to use you in in this next season um and and he, he he's he's the master he's the potter he knows exactly what he's going to create and 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 you know what kind of vessel he's going to create you into but um but the church back to the church we only have like a minute left yeah the church it, it, it woke the church up and it it really showed us all of us as christians like man the church could like be gone tomorrow and we know what that was like that yeah. was gnarly and no one wants to see that yeah. and it, it got the church like off of uh, cruise control and back on their toes to mm -hmm. see hey we got how what are we going to do now what's next so it was a great wake-up call and That's i think exactly right. even that the pulse of what's going on i'm not into politics and stuff but like just like the pulse of like what's going on with politics and the schools and the agendas and all this stuff like the church needs to be awake and be men and women mm -hmm. of the word of god and obey from genesis to revelations and see what god has for us in in this season so dude thank mm -hmm. you matt for uh for being on uh, you're the founder and drummer of August August Burns Red, and do you have a do you have some events coming up May 22nd, and your website mm -hmm. um, to learn how to drum. And there's just a lot of cool things, dude. Um, I was excited to come out for this interview, man. Uh, after just you know watching yeah, a little bit of your stuff, too. I was like, this is gonna be sick. <laughs> Let's yeah, it, I mean, it really was. I I I appreciate you having me on. My 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 final. Um, my final point that I want to make for anyone that is listening, I just felt like I should say this as yeah. you were talking there at the end. Um, what you're doing matters. What what you are doing, Ryan, matters. What you are doing as a listener, whatever you're doing, it matters. Um, and if you can look at life that way, then you you take care um, of of preserving the relationships that you have. You put all your your energy into the work that you're doing because it it's all important there's a TV show called Chernobyl and the fifth episode of Chernobyl is, has this incredible conversation between a scientist and a, and sort of a politician. And the scientist tells the politician who's totally underwhelmed at his own ability that what he's doing matters. And not only does it matter, it matters the most that the Kremlin sent the wrong man when they sent him. Oh. And it just blew my mind. And that is the end of the show. Dude. Right? <laughs> that, <laughs> that was awesome. Perfect. I'm not used to a timeline. <laughs> Peace. Love you, man. Thank this you. This has been The Ryan Reese Show. To connect and find out more about Ryan, click on ryan reesecom Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for The Ryan Reese Show.